Welcome to today's STAR Forum on the Global Refugee Crisis. Today's event is co-sponsored by the MIT Center for International Studies and the Inter-University Committee on International Migration. I'm Michelle Nooch, and I'm thrilled that you're here to be participating in this timely discussion. Today's talk will be a panel discussion followed by a Q&A with the audience. For Q&A, I just want to ask that you line up behind the mics. Um, we are taking a video of the event, and we need to capture your audio. And um, I wanted to say the talk will be moderated by Anna Hardman. Dr. Hardman has taught at Tufts University in the economics department since 1995. Her research focuses on urban economics and on migration. She's a member of the Inter-University Committee on International Migration and is currently organizing a workshop at MIT on the economics of forced migration. Dr. Hardman will provide a brief overview of the global refugee crisis and also introduce our panelists. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hardman. Michelle, thank you. Um, what I'd like to do is start by introducing the panelists and then give my very brief introduction to the subject of today's discussion. Uh, our first speaker will be Ali Ajundi, who's a project officer for Syria with Oxfam America. He's been a Syrian civil activist who's brought his diverse experience and wide knowledge of the Syrian conflict to his work at Oxfam America as a Syria project officer. Ali's work focuses on peace building and empowering Syrian civil society. Before he left Syria in 2012, Ali participated in establishing a local <coughs> NGO. He contributed to launching that NGO's platform. He helped to secure funds for sustainable community empowerment projects. He's also worked at U United Nations Receive and Work, uh, Relief and Work Agency on youth employment and career development. He has a bachelor's degree in economics from Damascus University and a master's in sustainable international development from Brandeis. Our second speaker is Nahuel Arenas, who's worked with Oxfam since 2007. He's led humanitarian responses in Mozambique, Chad, Mauritania, Burkina Faso, and South Sudan, and provided support for Oxfam's response in Haiti. He had previously worked for Action Against Hunger and Japan International Cooperation Agency in a number of other countries. He has a master's degree from SOAS in London, in international politics, and has degrees in crisis management and public policy. Uh, he joined Oxfam in 2013 as Deputy Humanitarian Director. He's now the Director of Oxfam America's Humanitarian Response Department. Our third speaker is Jennifer Leaning, the Francois Xavier Bagnou Professor of the Practice of Health and Human Rights at the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Leaning uh, directed the program on humanitarian crises and human rights at the Harvard School of Public Health. Subsequently, she was founder uh, and co-director of the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. Professor Leaning's research and policy interests include international humanitarian law in crisis settings, uh, human security in the context of forced migration and conflict, she has field experience in problems of public health and human rights in crisis situations. She's written widely on those issues. Uh, I have to say I remember very well a talk she gave a year or so ago at the Center for International Studies in which she talked about the Syria crisis in particular and which really made, to me, a great deal of difference in the degree of awareness of how profound the problem was. Professor Leaning has co-founded and served on the board of Physicians for Human Rights, on the boards of Physicians for Social Responsibility in Oxfam America. And then there's a list of journals she's edited, um, publishers for which she's on the board of, of directors of syndics. Um, I'm going to stop because if I read the whole of Professor Leaning's bio, we would be here a long time. Our last speaker is Serena Parekh, an assistant professor of philosophy at Northeastern University with degrees from Boston College, uh, Catholic University of, L of Louvain, and a BA from McGill. Uh, Pro Professor Parikh's primary interests are social and political philosophy and the philosophy of human rights. She's working on a manuscript about our moral obligations to refugees, which is forthcoming. It's going to come out from Routledge in 2016. 
The tentative title is Refugees and the Ethics of Forced Dipl Displacement. Um, and that is our board of speakers. You will be hearing them in a minute. I'm going to try to be just a little provocative in talking about introducing the topic of the global refugee crisis by asking first, is it global? Is what we're seeing in migration today really global? When, if we're thinking about Syria, what about are, are the forced migrants fleeing Syria or Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and the countries providing um, shelter for, or to some extent providing shelter for them, either in camps in Jordan, Lebanon? Um, or, uh, are those, uh, is that part of this work, my, uh, global re refugee crisis? Um, what, why is this, is, is this a global refugee crisis which also includes refugees and irregular migrants who are leaving Myanmar, who are leaving Central America? Is it because Europe is the destination that the Syrian crisis has attracted so much more attention? I don't say enough, and certainly not enough of a humanitarian response, but I think that's a question that deserves to be asked. Um, next question. Uh, the title of the, this event it includes the word refugees. Does legal status matter? I don't expect that everybody here is familiar with the legal definition of refugees, but I hope that one or more of the speakers will address that issue, that just because somebody leaves their country because they're afraid doesn't automatically make them, in legal terms, a refugee. Um, doesn't automatically make them eligible for asylum. It may make them eligible to apply for asylum, but there's a long way between applying and getting asylum. Um, thirdly, what makes it a crisis? Is it the size of the flow, the pace with which it increased? Uh, is it the destinations, which is back to Europe, which is reluctant, Lebanon, which is overwhelmed, Jordan overwhelmed, Turkey using the crisis to seek to elicit concessions from the European Union? Is it that the character of migrants, particularly the Syrian migrants, seems to be significantly different from many previous large refugee flows in Kosovo, in Rwanda, and so on? And not least, is it the smugglers? Is it the fact that the smuggling industry appears to have become much more important and much more dangerous than it has been in the past? And I guess lastly, highly visible deaths. I'm not going to introduce all the numbers, um, but let me just, the New York Times recently had a really excellent um, article which showed the relative size. This is, the photograph is about 160 migrants um, waiting in southern hu Hungary to board a bus to get registered. But can you see a minute blip, 160 migrants in the corner of the image that you're seeing? That's the scale of those people relative to the 160,000 people who were supposed to be allocated to different EU countries under the plan that's still being debated and negotiated at best. Um, the 549 refugees in Greece, Italy, and Hungary who were the only ones who were to be eligible for that EU resettlement plan. The 1.3 million people who've applied for asylum this year um, or the 4.7 million asylum seekers who are in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. And finally, is it the dangerous sea arrivals? The, many of the stories that we've been reading in the press are about dangerous sea arrivals, about the numbers of people. Certainly this summer, I saw an island I'm familiar with, which has received so far this year 4,600 refugees, migrants, what do we want to call them? Um, I'm not sure. I'm comfortable choosing a single word, but certainly people traveling in great distress, in great need. That's an island with a pop full time population of less than 2,000 people. And that's not one of the places most overwhelmed by refugees by any means. I'd like to introduce now, I've said a little, Ali Njundi, you're our first speaker. And you're going to. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about Syria, my beloved country. So I will talk in my presentation about Syrian culture, conflict routes, conflict timeline, and conflict impact on the Syrian 
people and about the refugee crisis, which is everybody is talking about now. And I will close with some comments. So first, Syria is one of the oldest civilization in the history, and everybody has some roots in Syria. If you see on this map, you will see multicultural, multi-ethnic, and religious group. They were living with each other for thousands of years, literally thousands of years. On the left, you can see this picture. This is from old Damascus in uh, an area called Hayil Amin. This is a Jewish family house. One of my friends, who was uh, a refugee, immigrated from Palestine to Damascus, he lived next to this uh, family. And he told me when he was a child, he used to uh, come to this family and to turn on their gas because on Saturdays, because they are Jewish families are not allowed to turn gas on on Saturdays. So they respect each other. They celebrate the, the Eid. They celebrate all the occasions. And they were still living there like this until recently. So opposite to now, we are talking about refugee crisis. Syria was a host of refugees from the area. First, when the genocide against Armenian happened in 1950s, Syria received 15. Syria received more than 100,000 refugees from Armenia, and the people in Aleppo were very generous with their own saving. They received them and allowed them to start their own lives. I am from the middle of Syria. In my town, it is a rural area. We received few families from Armenia, and. Uh, the people there, the local community, they helped them. They gave them a land and helped them to make a church in the town. Still the ruins of this church there. It is a Muslim district, but they helped the people to go. And because we have a lot of graves in our area, so they opened uh, one of the best wine factories in Syria in the 1940s and 50s. So when the Palestinian Nakba happened in 1948, Syria received Palestinians, more than half a million people. And they gave them full properties to live and to start their own life. When Iraq, uh, I mean the invasion happened and the, the conflict in Iraq happened, Syria received more than one million uh, people, Iraqis, refugees. Also Lebanon, when they have conflict, civil war in 1975 and in 2006, they received thousands of people. Others also. So this is the culture where we, when I came, I came to the uh, United States to study master in Brandeis. So the first day in my school, I went there. I met one American Somali. He hugged me and said, are you Syrian? I said, yes. Just arrived from, he, he started almost, he wanted to cry. I said, why are you are doing this? He said, because my cousin was a refugee in Syria. And he used to go there, and he loved the country, and he told me a lot about your civilization, about your culture, your, how you deal with the people. So I mean, this is the culture where we were before this uh, happened. So the approach I'm using, I mean, the, I will use the humanitarian I mean, aspect in looking to the Syrian crisis. It is development in reverse. And it happened everywhere because of uh, social exclusion, marginalization, slow economic uh, uh, growth in addition to some other uh, reasons or factors related to the uh, conflict, to the identity. So Syria started in 2000, the economic liberation process. But this process was not accompanied by a reform in law and regulations and the building suitable institutions. So this one of, I mean, I will try to say the key factors that why we have social uh, problems in Syria. So the, the liberation of economy uh, that start, they started, it made the disparity high, increased the disparity between the rural areas and the urban areas. It doubled in that time. Also, it deteriorated the, the agriculture sector, which was one of the main sources of income for the people because they cut the subsidies and we have very heavy drought 2006, 2009, which took 60% of the social, of the livestock in Syria. So we have, with this, we have uh, internal immigration from rural areas to main cities and they made informal uh, settlings and these are the people who started, I mean, the problem who felt disclusion, discluded and who, who felt marginalized and lack job opportunities. Also, the government tried to allow the public sector, the private sector to play its role, 
but because we don't have the regulations, we don't have the empowering environment, so the labor market managed to absorb 400,000 only out of 1.6 million newcomers to the market. So these are the situation, I mean, what was happening in Syria before the crisis. So it, it did not come in one night. So the, the, the conflict in Syria started by peaceful demonstrations in Dar'a in March 2011, and then in the summer, it moved to more, uh, more violent conflict with the establishment of the uh, Syrian Free Army and the extremist groups who started, I mean, forming, and the conflict with the government, so the brutal and the violent started by that time. In 2012, Kofi Amman tried to solve the problem on Geneva 1, and he failed. Then we have Geneva 2 in 2014, it failed also. And after that, uh, United, uh, the Khalifa announced, IS announced its Khilafa in Raqqa in uh, August 2014. Followed by that, uh, United States airstrike started, and then we have Russia now started its own airstrikes on the Syria. So this is what's going on in the country. If you see at this, like it is a proxy war, it is a new war where you cannot, I mean, uh, say this is internal factors, these are uh, external factors. So it is mixed and it is making the, the conflict worse and worse. And we cannot see, I mean, the violent conflict, we cannot see it without the Russia, United States, uh, Iraq, uh, uh, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran conflict. The regional conflict play a critical role in this. Uh, it's what, if we see now, with the, because of a vacuum of power and the problems, you see, I mean, like Syria became attractive destination for all extremists from all the world. We have now, some estimation, they say we have 7,000 groups, military groups, fighting in the country. So this is some of the humanitarian crisis. So, First, till now, we don't have any mechanism to protect the civilians, which is most, very most, I mean, needed for the people to stay in the country. The result is 250,000 killed, 1 million injured, and 7.6 million displaced. When we talk about displaced, you see the figure, but 7, 6 million means they lost their houses, children without education, forced labor, child labor. I mean, these are the, the, the associated things, no health, uh, services, no basic services, so this is one of the, some of the things that, and so in addition we have like five million people in hard to reach areas, 500,000 uh, among them are in besieged areas. So this is the crisis we are talking about. Some economic factors, we have war economy, now we have groups, fighting groups in the country, they have benefits from kidnapping, looting, and smuggling and selling goods in, uh, unimaginable prices, so there are people now who are benefit from this. Also, the sanctions, the European sanctions against, I mean, uh, the Syria export, Syria export also supported and has the, this uh, war economy. The Syrian, infl I mean, currency uh, uh, depreciated from 445 uh, Syrian pound for one dollar to 340 now, six, more than six times. Uh, seven million now live in extreme poverty. And we lost about 40% of the uh, capital investment and of the economy. The estimated, I mean, losses of this about more than $200 billion, the total loss in the Syrian crisis from 2011 till now. See the impact on the education. Syria was one of the best countries in the education. We have like 96% for men and 96% for the men uh, literacy rate. Now, 50%, 52% of the kids without uh, school, three years, most of them, they did not go to school. 90% in Daesh, in the terrorist area, they don't go to school. And we have 4,000 schools now either used for displaced people or out of uh, work, in addition to the risk of going and teaching and the lack of staff, so many things. This has also some associated results in, like the kids, they go and work for, to support their families. There are many issues related to this also. So the health sector, the basic services are missing in the country. More than 60% of the infrastructure is already destroyed. 
like in my hometown in the middle of Syria where this is the arrow. Like I talked to my mom, she told me like they stay 15 days without water. And like the electricity comes like few hours a day. So I mean, this is the kind of life the people are living. So we have some programs in the uh, United uh, Nations trying to help the Syrian people. I will not talk, I mean like, but still there are five million people underserved. It is very difficult to access and to reach them. So refugee crisis, if you see now we have, we talk about four million refugee crisis. Why this crisis? People are escaping because they don't have any other option, not because they want to have internet or to see TV in the United States or other countries. They don't have any other option, but still they have the, uh, the courage to travel and to have all the risks to save their families and their lives. Refugee crisis for Syria is more than Europe or United States because we are losing all the high educated people, we are losing all the human resources. It is a brain drain. Now we talk about the refugee crisis, we forget the, the reason. Look at these two charts, you see the casualties, it goes in the same direction with the refugees. So more casualties, more dead people, dead toll, you have more refugees. So this is the root of the crisis where we have to think not only to solve the refugee crisis. So what we can do, now all the people thinking about providing more arms, more weapons, more develop, not develop, it is very obvious that there is no military solution and everybody from United, uh, the Security Council talk about political solution but in practice they're providing different parties with more weapons. So we need some more work on this to implement the United uh, Nations uh, resolutions. So this is the key thing. We have to find things how to, to protect the civilians in Syria. If we don't protect them, they will not stop from going outside the country. So we have to deal with this. In, in brief, we have to deal with the crisis in its source, not at the borders. It is not to put walls, more walls, because people will not stop uh, fleeing. Provide them with some, some other options and they will be happy to stay in their countries. So at last, please, as Syrians, please give us some hope that we will someday we will go back to our country and participate in rebuilding our country. It is a very big task, but hopefully we will be able to do something in the future. And thank you. Good evening, my name is um, Nawel Arenas. I work at Oxfam as humanitarian director. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me, and I'm honored to be a member, uh, part of this panel. Um, my presentation will have uh, three uh, parts. One, I will uh, present some uh, facts and figures to put the uh, crisis in perspective. Then I will uh, share with you some of some stories of uh, Syrian refugees, uh, some of their personal stories, um, trying to uh, illustrate the, uh, the extent and nature of this crisis. And, and then I will uh, talk about what organizations like Oxfam are doing and what we think about this, uh, this crisis. Um, so this is uh, you know, the most recent uh, uh, aspect of the crisis and what we all are hearing about is the arrival of, of uh, refugees uh, alongside economic migrants in Europe. Uh, more than 600,000 uh, people uh, arrived uh, through the Mediterranean this year alone. Um, we have seen peaks of up to 7,000 people per day. Um, and uh, this is why this crisis in Europe is most of all a uh, protection crisis. The winter is coming, uh, the shelter are, and, and are over, overstretched. Um, there is no e enough facilities. 25% uh, of, uh, of the arrivals are children and up to uh, 6,000 unaccompanied children have been have been registered. Um, of course, the risk of uh, smugglers, traffickers, uh, all sorts of abuse uh, is there. Um, most of them are arriving are Syrians. Um, I don't know if it's uh, semantically, we should call it a global crisis, but what I know is that one if in every five uh, displaced people, uh, persons in the world is a Syrian. 
Uh, so it's the largest uh, uh, uprooted people in the world today. Um, so um, we are talking about uh, more than 250,000 this year arriving from Syria, uh, alongside with other nationalities like Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, and Eritrea. Um, but particularly in the Mediterranean route, uh, Syrians are 70% of arrivals. Um, but um, going back to, uh, to the roots of this crisis, um, you know, we know that there are, uh, Ali has mentioned 7.6 million uh, uh, Syrians displaced within Syria, and more than 4 million uh, uh, refugees. Uh, most of them are in four countries. Um, particularly in Turkey, about two million, more than a million in Lebanon. Uh, this is registered refugees. Um, I will talk more about the Lebanese case uh, in a moment. Uh, 650,000 in Jordan, uh, uh, 250,000 more or less in, um, in Iraq. Um, but uh, um, now we are, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the funding of this response, but uh, the reason why we see these uh, uh, effects in, 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 in Europe now, it's clear, it's just the uh, consequence of increasing desperation and hopelessness of Syrians uh, that see that their only chance to, uh, to get safety, safety and, and dignity is uh, risking their lives and crossing uh, into Europe. Um, so according to this um, data coming from the uh, European Union, uh, half a million uh, Syrians have uh, requested uh, for asylum. Um, just to put it in perspective, if they were all granted asylum, that would mean, uh, that would represent 0.07% of the European population. And even if Germany uh, accepted all of them, that would represent only 0.6% of uh, Germany's population. Just keep these numbers in mind because I will uh, also talk about what is the situation in some of the neighboring uh, countries uh, like Jordan and uh, uh, particularly Lebanon. So who are the Syrians coming to Europe? Uh, a recent study um, by Rich, this is from September, um, tell us that they are predominantly young uh, and male. This is uh, uh, the reason is because it is costly and it is uh, a trip of high risk. Uh, so many of them uh, go in advance of their families and try to get a more safe and legal way for their families to, uh, um, to join them uh, later on. Uh, an important piece of information, the majority of them have been previously living uh, as refugees in neighboring countries like Jordan, um, Lebanon, and, and Turkey and Iraq. Um, which uh, also confirms uh, the, uh, the situation, that the situation in these neighboring countries is not giving them uh, a sense of safety, a sense of, a sense of uh, dignity and, and, and certainty. Um, as Ali pointed out, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, Syria was a, a medium income country and these refugees are in, most of them in middle income countries. That makes the nature of this uh, crisis very different one, and also in terms of uh, in terms of uh, providing assistance that make it ma makes it much much more challenging. Most of the Syrians in in these countries are not in refugee camps; uh, they are uh, renting a house or an apartment in uh, places like Beirut or Amman. Um, the decreasing aid, uh, the lack of opportunities, uh, no jobs, uh, uncertainty. I mentioned this already. Um, but also the, uh, the sense that there is a, a window of opportunity now. Um, many of them are hearing some uh, uh, political leaders in, in, in Europe and thinking that this is an opportunity that they, are, you know, they might be welcome and uh, they don't want to lose this uh, chance, particularly uh, before the uh, winter starts. Um, and it seems that the trend will continue, uh, UNHCR I read are planning to uh, receive 1.5 million this year and another 1.5 next year. So we are in October now, and 10 months into the year, the, uh, um, the aid appeal for Syria is only being funded in 44%. Uh, 
this means uh, that uh, there are drastic cuts in aid. You either reduce the quality of the uh, assistance you are providing, or you reduce the number of people that are receiving assistance, or in most of the cases, both. Um, the, uh, um, uh, the countries that are hosting these refugees, like Jordan and Lebanon and Turkey, have been ex really uh, uh, generous. Uh, they have taken a disproportionate uh, burden in hosting refugees, and the support that other countries have provided has been uh, uh, very limited. Um, so you can see some of these figures. Uh, um, Turkey, I, I read yesterday in the news, uh, claims that they have spent already uh, 8 billion uh, euros in, uh, in supporting and, and in taking care of, of refugees. Uh, the Europe, Europe is, uh, I read, um, uh, willing to provide 1 billion. So there you see uh, the gap and you see the uh, political uh, complexity. Um, countries like Jordan spending uh, around eight, 870 million a year. Um, Iraq, um, the, uh, the Kurdish government, uh, it's doing a lot. They are uh, um, hosting uh, uh, refugees in camps, uh, uh, predominantly in the Kurdish region. Um, but uh, Iraq is a humanitarian crisis of its own. Um, there are 2.5 million of uh, internally displaced people in, in Iraq. Um, so um, so Iraq, Iraqis themselves are trying to uh, flee uh, uh, from conflict. So the case of Lebanon. Um, Lebanon <coughs> is estimated that they have a, a population of 4.5 million people. Registered refugees in Lebanon, more than one million people. That that uh, represents 25% uh, of their population. Uh, so uh, um, every one in every four people that you you cross in Lebanon is a Syrian refugee, and this is registered refugees um, um, because of the uh, um, pressure on these countries and on their economies. Uh, there are of course. Uh, trying to um, uh, put in place procedures that restrict the inflow of, of, uh, of refugees. And so um, sometimes, and it is the case in Lebanon, these procedures are so onerous and expensive that it is very difficult for, uh, for Syrians to renew, the, to get permits or renew the, their permits. Um, they are asked to uh, apply for visas, could be tourist visas for which they need um, uh, to have $1,000 in the pocket and a, and, a, and, a research, and a hotel booking, business visa, a medical visa, student visa. So it's been uh, very, very uh, difficult. Uh, if you're not a uh, registered refugee, refugee is very difficult uh, for you to get access to services like health services, um, education, schools, um, and, 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 and assistance in general. So it's been, that, that puts a lot of pressure also on refugees and um, we know the consequences. So let me share some of these stories. Um, um, I, I, I was in Lebanon last week, and I met this man. Uh, his name is Ahmed uh, Mohammed. Uh, he uh, came to Lebanon uh, this year uh, in uh, most of restrictions uh, imposed by the Lebanese government are in place since January. And since uh, May, the UNHCR actually stopped registering uh, refugees in Lebanon. Again, I'm saying Lebanese government has been very generous, but there's just been little support, and so uh, the solution is to impose more restrictions. Um, this man has 13 children. Uh, of course, uh, as you know, the people who have the resources, they might risk it and make it to, to Europe, but there's also other very poor people that uh, cannot do that. Um, he uh, lives in an, uh, what is, we call an informal tented settlement because there are no formal refugee camps in, in Lebanon, uh, with his uh, 13 children. His wife has uh, uh, health issues uh, but cannot get access to, um, to, uh, uh, to health services. And they are being asked by uh, um, the Lebanese government, asked for sponsors to, uh, to renew this, their permits. They are being asked for uh, $800 per person uh, by the uh, by a Lebanese sponsor. Multiply that by 15 means it's impossible for them. Um, two weeks ago, um, 
I've been uh, visiting our programs in Iraq. Um, a little bit of context of what's happening in Iraq, uh, because there's some also Iraqis uh, um, fleeing conflict and uh, uh, I'm traveling to Europe. Uh, this woman is uh, uh, her house below. That's her house it was being destroyed by ISIS. Um, she came back uh, after the uh, uh, Iraqi forces with uh, Shia militias and, uh, and the Kurds uh, um, liberated the area from ISIS. Uh, she's divorced. She's in, in charge of, of her kid. Uh, she's trying to rebuild her house by uh, by herself. Um, many people in in towns that have been uh, freed from ISIS uh, are still displaced because uh, the places have been destroyed. They don't have services, no water, no electricity, and uh, and some people also are uncomfortable if those towns are now occupied or uh, being policed by Shia militias. Um, so this is a situation um, in Iraq as well. Of course, this exa exacerbates uh, existing and underlying uh, ethno-sectarian uh, divisions. Um, I met this family last week in a, uh, in, a, uh, in a Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon. This is a Syrian-Palestinian family. Uh, they were living in a, in a Palestinian refugee camp uh, in Syria, the Yarmouk camp. Um, they were. They had an um, event management business. Um, they're actually. They have six children. Uh, two two daughters are uh, university graduates. One is a mechanical engineer. The other one studied uh, English literature. Um, the uh, the place where they were living was being bombed. At some point, they uh, told me it was. They could hear bombs every two minutes. Um, next day, al-Nusra, uh, al-Qaeda affiliated group in Syria, came and threatened them to, to take away their daughters. So they decided to flee, to um, go to uh, uh, Lebanon. Um, in Lebanon, they are also in a situation of uh, illegality. They don't have a, a proper permit. Uh, in addition to the res restrictions on, on, on Syrians, uh, uh, Palestinians in Lebanon are banned from exercising more than 50 um, professions. Uh, so basically, they cannot work. Uh, they are, uh, her son Omar, the uh, eldest one there, she's afraid that he might get into some kind of trouble and then there's no one that can help them. So they cannot work. They're living out of handouts. Um, and so her husband decided to go to Europe and risk his life. He took the route via um, Libya. He crossed the desert, uh, he uh, suffers from asthma, so it was very difficult for him. He got into a boat in uh, Libya. Uh, a boat next to him, his uh, sank and people drowned, but he, he made it to the Netherlands. And now they are waiting, it was gonna be a long wait, perhaps 18 months is the average, until they might get, they might reunify with their father uh, through uh, legal means. Um, this is uh, um, a registration facility in the uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in Serbia, in the border with uh, Croatia. Um, there are many many uh, registration uh, centers in 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 Serbia, uh, in the border uh, with uh, Bulgaria, in the border with Croatia um, as well. Uh, facilities are really overstretched. Um, in Greece, they receive uh, an average of five thousand people a day. Uh, you can imagine crowd situations, lack of uh, information on their, uh, on their uh, legal status, on their uh, rights, uh, protection issues, unaccompanied children, uh, lack of appropriate shelter, a lack of uh, communication means to communicate with their families. Um, lots of protection risks uh, when you have these situations, share toilets, share um, um, shelter, uh, share rooms. Um, and now we are uh, uh, facing the challenges of, of, of the winter. Uh, this woman, her name is Ada Musa. Uh, she is, this photo is, has been taken on October 5th. Um, she is in, uh, in Presevo in Serbia. Um, she um, has been waiting for 72 hours to, uh, to, uh, to get a travel permit uh, in a migrant and refugee center in Serbia. Um, they, uh, they are from uh, uh, Kamishli uh, in Syria. Ali, you might help me. 
Um, they went first to Lebanon, then to Turkey, then they took a small boat to Greece. Uh, of course, they paid uh, smugglers for the boat. Uh, they paid 1,200 for each adult and half for each children. Uh, she traveled with four children. Uh, but smugglers put, uh, uh, you know, the, the boat was supposed to, uh, um, to, uh, to hold 40 people. They put extra 10 people, and 10 minutes after they left, the boat, the boat began to sink. Uh, so they were forced to throw all their belongings uh, into the sea in order to stay afloat. Um, the uh, night before this uh, photo was taken, uh, they were exploited by a taxi driver who overcharged the family and then made them exit his vehicle shortly after they got it. Then they had to walk for 10 hours to reach this place. This is the last one. Uh, I took this picture last week in, a, in, a, um, in a, um, an informal tented settlement in the uh, Val uh, Beka Valley in Lebanon. Uh, these two children, uh, I, you know, they were playing. I asked them, what are you doing? They said, we are building the house we're going to live in when uh, we go back to Syria. Um, I think for me this represents that you know, these people are fleeing not poverty, they are fleeing conflict. And uh, refugees they just want to go home. So what uh, Oxfam, uh, what we have been doing, uh, we have reached in Syria, in uh, Jordan, and in Lebanon more than 1.6 million people uh, with uh, life-saving clean water, sanitation, and other um, uh, relief supplies uh, like blankets, stoves, voucher for hygiene, uh, supplies, uh, building showers, and toilet blocks in refugee camps, in uh, informal settlements, and also in some of these uh, desert routes that people used to um, um, to uh, um, fly from conflict. Uh, this is the uh, Zatari camp where in Jordan, where uh, Oxfam has uh, built a water scheme that is serving the 85,000 people that live there. Uh, but we also built many of these uh, schemes of repair wells in, the, in Jordan, in, in host communities, in the Beka Valley, in Lebanon, and also inside Syria, um, uh, where we have rehabilitating systems in Damascus, and also we are planning to rehabilitate a water system in Aleppo that will uh, give uh, one million, more than one million people uh, clean water. Uh, this is a different kind of project. I, I visited these projects uh, last week in the Beka Valley in, in Lebanon. This is a um, just as an example, a, a solid uh, waste treatment facility that employs uh, refugees on a rotational basis. They are being paid uh, $20 a day uh, in harvesting potato dedicated uh, $4 a day. And other projects maintaining public spaces. Uh, but this is in, a, in an interesting place because it's in a, in a town that, uh, it's a town where 10,000 Lebanese live, but they host 40,000 Syrians. Um, so these kind of projects not all, only uh, you know, provide an income to refugees and you know, dignity of being able to work, but also help uh, reduce those tensions between host communities and, and refugees. Um, you know, distribution center uh, in, in, uh, in Serbia. I won't go into uh, more detail on that. So um, w we do think that uh, you know, no single measure with, uh, will be uh, solve the displacement crisis, but we think that uh, there is need, we need a change of approach and one that puts uh, uh, dignity and safety of people uh, first. Um, Europe is now uh, feeling the ripple effects of the Syria crisis, uh, but this will only increase if the uh, suffering and violence, violence are, are not addressed. Uh, so we are asking uh, um, rich countries to contribute with their fair share, both in funding uh, the, uh, the uh, aid response but also uh, resettling at least 10% of uh, the total refugee population. The UNHCR has uh, estimated that the 10% of the refugees are the most vulnerable ones. Um, and of course, uh, first and foremost, the source of the sprawling crisis needs to be addressed. Uh, we are pushing for the implementation of the UN Security Council resolutions. Uh, we are calling for an immediate heart of the transfer of arms and ammunition into Syria and uh, deliberate attacks on civilians. And uh, of course, uh, call parties to abide by international humanitarian law, international uh, human rights law, and uh, of course, revive the political uh, commitment to uh, find a resolution to the conflict. Thank you.
Good afternoon. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be to be here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, the sort of broader overviews of uh, refugee and, and the uh, international um, system and how it is now working to some extent. But more, I'm going to give you a, an overview of some of the uh, ways in which we think about refugee and forced migration uh, factors from the perspective of public health. So briefly on context and norms, we'll talk a bit about the wars and why they are so um, linked to forced migration. And then I'll move into some public health discussions and a few examples. So the context and norms, and actually Noel just talked about them um, in his last part of remarks. One must bear in mind that this is what we're um, taught. This is what we are bound by. This is what the um, international normative and legal framework is enveloping all humanitarian response, whether it's Oxfam directors, Oxfam in the field, um, International Community of the Red Cross has been um, pivotal in developing a lot of these norms. Uh, the UN uh, is very involved in these um, issues and has contributed in terms of treaties to much of what we now know as international human rights law and refugee law. So this is a set of covenants and treaties that are black letter law that bind nation states that discipline military and that um, provide the guidance and the norms for the uh, official and unofficial, that is, institutional and civil society humanitarian NGOs. And if um, you hear words coming up uh, like protection or dignity or uh, safety or public health or hear about Oxfam working on Watsan, all of these are issues that are embedded in this context and have, uh, to the extent that they have pertain to public health, are bound by uh, a number of public health understandings and um, guidelines. So it's not a chaotic field. Um, years ago, it was much more chaotic. But uh, under the stress of this particular volume of uh, forced migrants, distressed migrants, um, the system is having difficulty meeting its standards of safety, dignity, health, protection. Uh, and um, the fundamental issue is one of funding. Uh, it's one of manpower. Uh, but behind that, it's that the uh, extent to which this system of um, peace and security has actually kind of fallen apart. We cannot, as a um, global community, say with any certainty that we're actually maintaining peace and inter international security for everyone in the world, which was the aim and the solemn vow at the end of World War II, um, leading to the foundational language of the UN Charter in 1945. So it's a, it's a, <clears throat> it's a climax of uh, issues that have been taking um, their own slow way of bubbling to the surface, unaddressed issues. And we're now seeing it explode on the national and international stage um, in ways that are catching some people by surprise. Even, I don't mean some, I mean many people by surprise. And even many of us who've been working within the system and occasionally come back and um, lick our wounds and think and talk and write about these things in academic settings and then go work in another um, agency or do investigations in the field. Going back and forth so you're local and then you come out and see the bigger picture still hasn't prepared a number of us for the astonishing speed with which um, this calamity has now been brought upon our seas and our uh, landmass. The human security uh, discussion I will not go into today. It's one that I'm deeply um, interested in. And it, it provides a certain amount of surround sound. It does not sound as legally based. It's filled with norms and understandings about human beings and their attachment to the land, their attachment to each other, their sense of the future. Uh, and if you look at what's going on now from a human security perspective, you can see how devastating um, this uh, life has become for millions of people, probably hundreds of millions, because we'll be getting to this later in the talk. Um, this might well be the tip of the iceberg uh, behind the people that are being helped out of these terrible circumstances, life-threatening circumstances. Um, soul-destroying experiences, the people that are being helped out, uh, including by um, completely voracious and um, invidious smugglers, uh, 
And I agree, Anna, that the smugglers are making a big difference. But if they were not there, the people would not be able to leave, and then we'd have different sets of issues. I'm not saying that you were, um, you were saying that, but there's, there are many people making, making money out of this, including a lot of unscrupulous ones. But the point being that if they weren't able to flee, they would be dying and in terrible circumstances from the places they're trying to flee from. But the fact that they're trying to flee suggests that you have to look backwards and say, what are they fleeing from? And this is where this tip of the iceberg um, analogy begins to have some valence. And I will come back to that in a, in a moment. And the points that I'm talking about now here in terms of public health are the evolution of public health approaches over the last 40 years in an approach to populations that have, met, have been trying to flee from war or major disasters. So public health in crisis settings is usually in the setting of forced migration, either a lot of forced migration or some along with people that are devastated in place. And uh, a much longer talk would go into our epidemiology and understanding of the conditions and how people suffer and how we uh, get to understand what they need in, in health terms um, and get into the standards and the ethics of that. But I will not talk about that today. I'm just evoking it here as the context and norms in which uh, when you read about these things in the papers or you talk to us later uh, in the Q&A or in the course of your own study, um, it's, it's very important for you, if you're critiquing it or applauding it, that you begin by understanding the norm and context in which these efforts are underway. The n recognition that war in, is a public health problem uh, is actually um, lamentably late in coming to the pu public health community. Public health was built on the foundations of water and sanitation, stopping communicable and infectious disease. Uh, long before the germ theory was understood, we, in the mid-19th century, began to reduce deaths in urban areas by looking more closely at the water systems and their pollution by fecal oral contamination. Now we um, get into the uh, mid to late 20th century, and after two world wars, um, some devasta devastating epidemics and massacres, and then on top of that, genocides. And <clears throat> In the shadow of the nuclear threat, where the numbers of people at risk from certain kinds of war were astronomical, uh, the public health community woke up and began to say, we need to look at the conditions that are causing deaths and morbidity in these highly contested armed conflict situations. Uh, so the, the, all of us in public health who are looking at war and disaster are part of a vanguard of a field that is really only 75. Um, years old and really has gone into high speed in the late 1980s, mid-1980s in the context of response to famines in the Horn of Africa. So the methods we use are developed for assessment of famine-related mortality in nutritionally <coughs> deprived areas in the Horn of Africa. That's where the seasoned practitioners started. That's where they started helping us understand how to get information out of uh, relatively chaotic situations. And it's from that legacy that the rest of us have begun to learn and teach and um, improve our understanding and our methods. So the gurus of that set of um, uh, responders, humanitarian responders, um, are now very senior in schools of public health, in academic arenas. They're on the boards or leadership of major NGOs. Some of them retired. Um, that generation, as um, all generations do, um, is fading, but they've been very, very good at teaching the next several generations coming up. And they are the progenitors of much of the literature that we have on public health in war. So if you look at the wars of the, the 20th century, um, you can see that we have a uh, preponderance of internal conflict, that they target civilians, they have inescapable public health conflicts, uh, con consequences which often are um, severe um, human rights issues attendant upon them and uh, significant environmental impacts. And this is uh, possible to see from the uh, sort of heuristic here. It's not, don't press too hard in statistics, but in general, at the start of the 20th century, um, the majority of, of casualties were military, and by the end of the 20th century, the majority, great majority, are civilian, non combatant. And uh, hold that in mind. And another set of um, Descriptors here that, uh, again, you could challenge the numbers, but the trends are fairly important um, and, and they're powerful regardless of uh, quibbling over 
which war you're counting as a war in what year. You can see here that if you look at armed conflict by region from 1946 to 2014, uh, we have a marked increase in the number of wars that are beginning um, after World War II, and they are essentially driven by wars in Africa and Asia, and you're just starting to see the edge, 2014, which is using 2013 data, you're just starting to see the edge of the uptick in the Mideast, which is the bar in black. Uh, so what, the other point this does not make, though, is that and this is cumulative. It's every year. Okay, You're seeing every year um, the prevalence tracking forward, and any peak is starting to show new wars coming in or others going away. But it is sedimented. The point is that these wars last now for 20, 25, 30 <coughs> years. And that is the grim background upon which we view what is going on in Syria. This has all the earmarks of a war that's going to go on for a very long time. And then uh, this is a, a, a messy slide, but just look at the orange, all right? This is the increase in the stability of internal civil wars, um, or the yellow is the wars that have become internationalized because of uh, international intervention in them. And the actual conventional wars are at very low number. It doesn't mean that the conventional wars are causing fewer casualties. When you have conventional wars, you have great powers like the United States or others with very, very heavy armaments. But these civil wars have a tendency, a character, set of characteristics, which is they lay waste the land, they attack civilians and force them to flee, and they basically create conditions um, that make it very difficult to return. <clears throat> so here is where uh, I'd like to just focus for a moment, uh, this notion of forced migration. Because when we're talking about public health and war, we're talking about dealing with people who are fleeing the war. And it is very difficult to get into the war and take care of people. And we can come back to that um, in the Q&A. But the, a fundamental issue of doing good work in public health is access. And by access, I mean not just getting there, but being able to stay there, to set up an operation and see the disease or the illness or the surgery through, rather than having to move quickly because there's a threat or basically have to fall on the operating room to protect the patient because there's a bomb. You can't really do good work in the midst of war. And that's, that's an important facet of, of the <clears throat> dilemma about Syria, because uh, much of Syria is now pretty hot in terms of its uh, impact, the impact of the war on populations that are huddled there. So people are either fleeing from war and atrocity, or they're fleeing from major diseases, or famine, or environmental degradation, or climate change, and increasingly their level of desperation is high enough, it's a little difficult to say, well, this person who's fleeing a self-settled um, suburb in Beirut going now to try to get into Europe. In other words, Syrian in Lebanon, getting out of Lebanon and trying to go into Europe. Is that person any worse off than people that are coming out of the Libyan war and desert or from deep in the Sahel? They've tried for years. There's increasing drought. They can't make a living. Boko Haram is coming there, and they are fleeing to get up through the Mediterranean into Europe. You know, how do you say that one person has the capacity to become a refugee and the other person is a migrant that has no status in terms of claims on safety and protection. And this massive flood of refugees that are of, of people, we, I'm using the word distressed migration, the massive number of people, but you can see when Anna was talking, there's this back and forth, what is the language now? And the fact that we actually aren't certain about the language is linked to the fact that it is a great mixture of highly miserable people who are coming from the collapse of their societies for a variety of reasons. And that's why I'm suggesting, I'm not alone in this, that we're seeing just the start of a migration that has been brewing, essentially, in the sea of rising aspirations that's been brewing for um, maybe 40 years. So uh, we, for all of these populations, have core interventions that link to their emergency needs security, shelter, water, food, sanitation, health, and protection. There's only, in one of those phrases is the word health come in, but in terms of norms and protection, 
and trying to do the right things for people in the right sequence. Health is actually not the first thing you're trying to provide. The first thing you're trying to provide for people is security. Um, space where they are no longer being directly targeted. Uh, then you are trying to give them a sense of shelter where they can get in and be collected with friends or family. And then there's a big push for water, and often water and shelter in combination, competition for timing because you need both so uh, drastically and fast. Food, for sure. People can live with not much food for quite a long time, except for pregnant and nursing mothers and little kids. <clears throat> and then sanitation comes in as a key factor, because otherwise you'll see the eruption of a disease, because people are informally congregated, they're close quarters, their immune systems are down, they're malnourished, and that's just basically, uh, and they're subject to the environment, which is often cold or wet, and that essentially breeds disease of all kinds. Um, and then protection, which is essentially looking at who is more likely to be harmed by this environment than others. And so you have categories of vulnerability that vary depending upon the situation, the context, the culture, and we can talk about that, but generally speaking, um, in these wars, civilians themselves are vulnerable, then women and children, uh, people with disabilities, people who belong to stigmatized minorities, um, these are the categories of people you have to pay attention to, whether they're in camps or you are encountering groups of them in self-settled situations in urban areas. The problem now with the current influx of refugees is that people are on the move, very difficult to count them or assess them, and as they are coming out into Lebanon and Jordan, Turkey to some extent, and certainly in Iraq, they're not staying in one place where you can actually get an assessment of who they are. Uh, Public health people and UNHCR, um, so refugee analysts and protection officers, we like camps. Uh, and we put that in quotes because camps are dispiriting places and people in them hate them. So they're not good ideas. They're criticized and critiqued throughout the public health and humanitarian community. But from the standpoint of getting information and then being able to deal in <clears throat> response to that information with groups and populations and families in an effective and reasonable way, it's great if they're in one place for a while. Okay. But if they're self-settled, then it's very difficult to apply some of the measures that we know. And in this context of forced migration, more and more issues of temporary or permanent displacement come to the, to the um, fore, and we're talking about uh, whether they can return and what are they returning to. So this is the discourse in forced migration. And if you look at refugees and IDPs um, from the end of uh, World War II, we always thought we would never see a peak that we saw at 50 million in Europe alone at the end of World War II. This figure of 50 million, of course, was not counting the refugees in Asia that were, uh, or in Africa, that, of whom there were millions um, as a result of World War II. So this is the myopia of the West in counting this. Uh, but in any case, 50 million, we'd not seen it until what is occurring now. It's upwards of 60 million refugees and IDPs. We've got them together, but the majority of them the majority of them are internally displaced. So uh, we have a number of interventions. I've mentioned them, some of them there. I'm just recapitulating them now. And when you are going to try to get access to a population to see what is going on and how to um, deal with them and what their needs are, you first have to counter the problem of access. This is a road in uh, North Darf, uh, Chad, Darfur border area. And we are early days of the war in, um, Darfur, 2004-2005, and uh, it's before much of a camp has been set up. We know there are refugees there. We're heading out, and this is sandstorm, um, very hot, uh, and uh, landmines from previous wars, and the winds are whipping up over the road, so you actually lose the road. You don't want to because you go off track, and you're going to hit landmines. So this is the access for the humanitarian community. I was part of a human rights group, but this is the access for the humanitarian community to just get up and see what was going on with the huddled populations. Every different situation has different access issues in terms of security to the personnel and security to the people you're trying to reach. The biggest thing you need in terms of trying to understand what is going on with people in a public health context is information. And much of our work involves getting the information about the needs that people have. And then including that, you need to get information on protection. And the reason some of this is so important in war and forced migration is that uh, if you, the studies that have been done by 
uh, humanitarian actors trained in the techniques that were developed in the 1980s at war-related and um, temporally mortality in the war zones uh, mortality, when you look at this, you find that their great majority of the deaths occur not from actual combat, but from the collapse of health services and morbidities from um, various kinds of uh, wounds and infectious diseases and malnutrition. This is why public health of these studies is so important. <clears throat> um, the first use of humanitarian methods to assess what was going on in refugees in a war setting, not in a famine or massive calamity uh, setting, uh, was in the early 1990s in the Gulf War, where a study was done with the Kurdish refugees who had um, fled out of the comfortable areas they lived in in Iraq up to the Turkish border. Uh, it was after um, the, the wake of the Gulf War when the U.S. decided not to go into Iraq, which <clears throat> most of us thought then was a good idea, and looking back, it was a very good idea. Uh, but we allowed Saddam Hussein to think that he could go after the Kurds, and he went after them, and they fled to the north. Turkey closed its borders to the Kurdish uh, refugees, and they were up there in barren, high, uh, exposed, mountainous areas. And these were suburban Kurds. And the question we heard that they were dying, and the question was why. And people thought it was because they didn't have blankets, they didn't have shelter, they didn't have food. And a study went up, a team went up to actually do mortality studies, and this is what they found, death by age, Kurdish refugees. You can see that the majority who are dying are kids, right? Okay, age is very important. And the next thing you learn when you ask who, di who died and how old they were, you ask why, and it turns out it was diarrheal disease. This population did not know how to deal with stream water, which was scanty in any case. And they were drinking it, they were defecating and washing in it, they were washing their clothes in it, and they were cleaning their houses and their tents with it. And so you had a complete contamination of the water sources and everybody was sick with diarrhea and the children were dying of it. This was what taught everybody that the same techniques you use in the study of famine and disaster affected populations are going to give you very good insights into what's going on in public health in war zones. And I just would like to leave you with one point about that was a picked up <clears throat> in one of the talks earlier. Why do people feel in war? It's because they're being attacked in war. And this is the streets of Sarajevo during the siege in 1990s. Uh, snipers around the hills were killing people. There was no water, no food. They'd go out to try to get something. People got shot, civilians. People fled trying to leave on days where the UN allowed a ceasefire to take place precipitously left the areas where they were the stigmatized population. And as they left, um, you had phenomenal issues of child protection and separation. This is ICRC trying to work on this, so the kid had a label. But in this bedlam, families are uh, separated, and it takes a very long time for people to come back together to reunite. And so what I'd like to end here on, on this um, point is that you can try to get access, you could try to get um, the measures in, you try to work within norms, but the numbers now are at a place where we have to have different methods and different ideas and different approaches. And in the Q&A, I'd be glad to go into some of those ideas um, if you're interested. Thank you. My name is Serena Perak. I'm a professor of philosophy at Northeastern University. And I'm afraid from b being a representative of the stodgiest discipline, I don't have a PowerPoint to share with you today. Um, but I will be talking about our moral obligations to refugees. So the, the war in Syria has, of course, been going on for several years now. But it's only recently that we've begun discussing our moral responsibility to refugees. And I actually trace this moment back to the publication of the photo of Alan Kurdi, the Syrian child who washed up on the shores of Turkey late in the summer of this year. And it was after this moment that people started using the language of moral responsibility and moral obligation, including politicians like David Cameron, who really hadn't used that language before. 
So now there's a debate hotly contested in the media, among politicians, and of course in philosophy, over what precisely our moral obligations are to refugees, to people fleeing conflict and, forced, and other forms of forced displacement. So what I thought would be helpful today is to talk about how the international community has understood our obligations to refugees, both um, theoretically and in international law, and then suggest some ways that we might reframe the way we think about our moral obligations to refugees. So I, of course, don't have time to, sh to you know, discuss how it would be grounded in theory or to show how it would be realized in practice, but I hope to just begin a more robust conversation about how we might understand our moral obligations to refugees. To begin, I want to point out that it's not widely agreed that we have obligations to refugees. Indeed, that we have moral obligations to any needy non-citizens, period. Many people believe our only moral obligations are to people who are fellow citizens. If we do have obligations to non-citizens, they're what are sometimes called Good Samaritan obligations. So we have obligations to help, but only when the need is great and the cost to us is very, very small. And this, of course, doesn't really apply to the contemporary situation of refugees, as we've learned about even this evening. The need is very, very high, and so these Samaritan obligations don't really get us very far. So if you're looking at our, where do our moral obligations to refugees come from in international law, we go back to the period at the end of the Second World War, as was discussed earlier. So at the end of the Second World War, we realized we had done something terrible. Here were innocent people being displaced from their home countries, fleeing persecution, and if we ignore them, they would go back and they would be killed or tortured or some horrible thing. And we realized we did a terrible job of that and we needed to do a better job. So at the end of the Second World, Bo World War, we the, we, the international community, agreed upon a set of international legal norms that was codified in the UN Refugee Convention of 1951, and this led to the formation of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, who is sometimes referred to as the UNHCR. Now, this is the largest international body that deals with refugees. And the UNHCR was tasked with implementing this UN Convention on Refugees, as well as protecting refugees, and finding one of the three durable solutions, as they're called. Either repatriation to the home country once conflict has ended, resettlement in a third country, or integration into the host country where the refugees find themselves. What I want to suggest is that in the Refugee Convention, there are two asymmetrical sets of obligations that pertain to, uh, to states. So the first set of obligations has to do with asylum seekers. So asylum seekers are people who are actually physically in the territory of the country they're claiming asylum in. So the pictures we've been seeing of Syrian migrants on, in Greece and Italy and um, throughout Europe, these are asylum seekers. And the most strongly recognized legal norm and moral norm is the norm of non-refoulement. This says that a state cannot send an asylum seeker back to his home country if he or she has a well-founded fear of persecution. So at the very least, if somebody is claiming asylum, a state has an obligation to hear their claim and to assess whether their claim is legitimate, whether they really are fleeing persecution or not. And this, frankly, is why you don't see sort of mass deportations of people from coming from Syria or from other places. They can't according to international law. I mean, what's interesting is the extent countries will go to to avoid people coming coming to their territory for that reason, but I'll talk about that in a minute. But this is a very strong, widely recognized and widely supported international norm. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, we have obligations to refugees who are in refugee camps. So people who are considered refugees according to the UNHCR, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, but are abroad, or oftentimes, most often, close to the con situation of conflict. So as we talked about, or as we heard about earlier, the majority of Sor Syrian refugees are in the five countries that are closest to Syria. Now, we have very, very few obligations to refugees that are not physically in our country. In fact, there is no moral or legal norm that requires us to resettle refugees, and there is no requirement to fund the UNHCR or any other refugee organization. Everything is strictly a matter of generosity and benevolence. So it's a supererogatory duty, as we would say in philosophy, and not a matter of obligation. So if we resettle refugees, it's because we are generous and kind and we love to help people, but not because we're, we're fulfilling a moral or legal norm. So you see then we have these two really broad asymmetrical obligations to refugees, and I think this has led to three consequences, that some of which have been alluded to already. 
Um, the first consequence is that, not surprisingly, the UNHCR has been chronically underfunded since its inception and as of today. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, the UNHCR receives less than 40% of, of what is needed in order to fund humanit humanitarian response to Syrian refugees and to refugees everywhere else in the world. Uh, this has meant, and in fact, their funding has gotten lower as conflict has gotten worse, as, then, as there has been more deaths of civilians and more refugees fleeing from Syria. So they've gotten less in proportion to their need. Things have gotten so bad that for the first time since the start of the war, more people are returning from Jordan to Syria instead of coming from Syria to Jordan. So let me pause on this for a moment. Refugee camps in Jordan are now so bad that individuals in them are choosing, preferring to go back to the chaos and deprivation and hardship of civil war rather than to live in refugee camps. So refugee camps are in many ways not what they're supposed to be, namely places of refuge, places of security, places where you could access healthcare, uh, rights, security, dignity, and so on. So we've done a terrible job of funding um, the relief, the humanitarian relief effort. And again, because there's no moral obligation that states feel. I mean, anything we do is generous, and anything we don't do, we should not be criticized for not doing it. The second outcome of this asymmetry in obligations is the discrepancy in burden sharing. So globally speaking, 87% um, of people who are forcibly displaced remain in the global south, so on the one hand. On the other hand, less than 1% of refugees, of people the UNHCR designates as refugees, are ever resettled in the West. So that's a huge discrepancy. Um, and this is, of course, true in the case of Syria. So though there have been about 650,000 asylum applications in Europe, the vast majority, of course, remain within Lebanon, Turkey, um, and the other countries surrounding it, creating a huge burden for these countries. Um, so the debate within the Western media and among politicians is whether we should be resettling you know, 1%, 2%, 3% of refugees. And of course, this doesn't even come close to addressing the real core of the problem. And it, doesn't, it fails to even question the morality of whether it is acceptable for the poorest states in the world to bear the biggest burden of hosting refugee populations. That's not even a question that's raised. Finally, the, the final outcome of this asymmetry in obligations um, that, that we have no moral or legal obligation to resettle refugees, but strong obligations to process asylum seekers, is that countries in the global north have been largely concerned with implementing policies of containment. They've, been, they've aimed to contain refugee flows as their primary concern, rather than to actually take seriously the rights and dignity of refugees. So this is why the vast majority of refugees remain in protracted situations in the global south. Um, some have argued that encampment, right, placing refugees in long-term camps, have, has become the de facto fourth solution. This is, in fact, how we've decided to solve the refugee crisis, by keeping them in camps far away from Western shores. Um, Two-thirds of refugees live in protracted situations, on average for 17 years, and 40% of refugees live in camps. And within these camps, they are not permitted to work, so they are, almost, they are entirely dependent on international aid, which, as I mentioned earlier, is sorely lacking, or illegal work to survive for, again, these prolonged periods of time in the global south. So to stress, this is an outcome of the, the sort of outshoot of how international law has developed and the way we've chosen to instantiate our moral thinking about refugees into international law. So northern states have few obligations or incentives to help refugees not on their territory. But because of the strength of the principle of non refoulement they have strong incentives to keep refugees as far as possible from their territory. And this is why Western states have been largely concerned with favoring policies of containing refugee flows outside of Western regions. Um, so in short, Western states acknowledge that refugees need help, but at the same time are very anxious to make sure that they don't um, come close to actually affecting us politically. So this outcome can be seen when we look at the way the three durable solutions that I mentioned have actually been put into practice. So in 2014, 2014 according to UN numbers, there were 59.5 million forcibly displaced people in the world. 126,000 were able to return to their home countries. 
another 105,000 were resettled in 20 different countries around the world. And there's no data on local integration that's available. So what happens then to the more than 59.2 million people who are outside of their homes but do not qualify for any kind of state protection? The answer is that they remain in the global south in refugee camps or in informal settlements, settlements in urban areas, um, supported by a largely underfunded UNHCR and other, of course, NGO humanitarian groups. Um, and effectively, what this is is the success of a Western policy that is aimed at containing refugee flows as far as possible from Western shores. And this is why the current crisis is often discussed as a crisis for Europe. It's a crisis of a failure of this policy for Europeans, and only secondarily a humanitarian crisis for the refugees themselves. This is why it's not surprising that in the EU's most recent talks with Turkey, they focused on how can Turkey do a better job of containing refugees, rather than on discussing how the basic rights and dignity of refugees within Turkey can be preserved and, and helped and supported. And of course, Europe is not the only country that's doing this. There was a recent piece in the New York Times that revealed that the United States in the past year has paid tens of millions of dollars to the Mexican government to intercept asylum seekers coming from Central America to the US. So we all remember there are asylum crisis last year when we had thousands and thousands of children crossing over the border in the south of the United States to seek asylum, and this was terrible public relations disaster. We didn't know what to do with them. So rather than saying, well, how can we address this situation at its root? How can we set up centers for protection and aid and preserve their human rights? Our, our way of dealing with the crisis has been to say, well, what can we do to make sure they don't show up in the first place? And what that's meant is to pay the Mexican government to intercept asylum seekers at train station, migrant centers, um, other kinds of shelters, other kinds of places of protection. So given this very dreary situation, it's important to step back and ask, you know, despite the political realities of what's going on, how ought we to think about our moral obligations to refugees in light of the realities of forced displacement in the 21st century? And let me just briefly remind you what we're talking about or what this reality is. A population roughly the size of Italy, 59.5 million people, live outside the protection of the nation state. When a person finds herself displaced from her home country due to war, political persecution, gang violence, environmental destruction, she will on average remain displaced for close to a generation and oftentimes longer. Of the forcibly displaced considered refugees, which is a small, small portion of those people consider who are displaced, less than 1% will ever be resettled in the West, uh, though the number is slightly higher at the moment for Syrian refugees. So if we do have moral obligations to refugees, as at least many people have begun to wonder and discuss out loud, it's crucial that we expand our way of thinking about helping refugees from simply thinking about it in terms of resettlement to engaging many of the other forms of harm that they experience. I think we ought to take seriously the moral obligations to the forcibly displaced that we have while they are between their homes. That is, while they are between their initial situation of displacement, which of course everybody agrees is wrong and bad and terrible, to a solution, whatever solution that may be, whether it's returning home or resettlement or local integration, which everyone of course agrees is a good thing. Most of the people who are displaced remain in these in-between periods for prolonged periods of time and suffer violations of dignity and rights in a profound way. One of the specific harms I think we have a moral obligation to address is the use of refugee camps to deny the displaced basic rights and polit political participation for prolonged periods of time. I think we morally ought to challenge the practice of using camps as spaces of containment and confinement. And of course, this is a problem that's distinct from a question of resettlement, which of course is a, a different moral obligation that we have and that we should discuss. But we ought also to think about how we allow refugees to be treated while they are displaced, while they are awaiting this more permanent solution. The reason that ethical treatment of the displaced is often ignored is because it's seen as both exceptional and temporary. But displacement is so much a fact of everyday political life that far from being seen as exceptional, it ought to be seen as a norm. It ought to be treated as a normal outcome of political, political life. Um, and secondly, rather than being uh, 
uh, temporary. As I've mentioned, the average displacement is close to 20 years. This is a long-term duration that we ought to be preparing for and thinking about morally. So we can't just think about immediate humanitarian relief as bodies to be kept alive, but we must think about human beings in this long-term duration that they will be living in for increasing longer periods of time and increasingly large numbers. And in addition, we ought to challenge the practices of states that aim to contain refugees in other countries and prevent them from seeking asylum in a different country. And the right to seek and enjoy asylum is a foundational right in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In the US, I feel like we hear very often about the brutality of Central America and what people are fleeing from there. And yet, as far as I know, little has been said about the Obama administration's policy of preventing asylum seekers from coming to the US through paying the Mexican government to essentially raid migrant shelters, train stations, and other safe havens, and forcibly return people to places where their lives are in danger. This, of course, is a gross violation of the spirit, if not the letter, of the, of the law of non, against non-refoulement. And it's morally reprehensible, regardless of how politically expedient it is. So to conclude, you know, there is, of course, a philosophical debate over how to ground these moral obligations. There's an economic debate over how we would pay for them. And there's a political debate over how we would convince our fellow citizens to take on the challenge of helping refugees. That's all true. But I think it would be achievement, an achievement if we merely acknowledge the gross moral injustice that is at the heart of our current refugee policies, and that we have a moral obligation to consider the treatment of the displaced through all stages of their displacement, not just in terms of resettlement. So to connect my claims to the recent refugee crisis in Europe, we can say that on my view, the moral obligation of the United States to Syrian refugees is not exhausted by resettling 10,000 refugees, even though this may seem like a large number to some. We must continue to ask, what's going to happen to the close to 4 million and growing number of people from Syria that have been displaced from the war? Under what conditions will they be forced to live? <coughs> Even if we are not willing to resettle more refugees, we are still obliged to ask this question. And the answer to it may require that we substantially increase our funding, indeed that we fully fund the humanitarian response, that we lobby other countries to resettle more refugees, that we come up with temporary legal protection statuses and other temporary measures in surrounding countries that actually protect the dignity and rights of refugees and not merely keep them alive in their bodies. We must be concerned with our ethical obligations to the millions of people who will never be resettled in the West and will spend decades living in refugee camps that are supported, at least in part, by the policies of our states that aim to contain refugees far from our borders. We ought to challenge states towards building a more just refugee regime when they take seriously the full human rights of the displaced. Thank you. Okay, th thank you all. Uh, we now have some time for questions. Um, as Michelle said, we'd like you to stand in line at the microphones if you have questions so that uh, you can be recorded for the video of this event. Um, and I see we have at least one question over there. We can start with you. Blake Parker, Amnesty MIT. I wanted to compliment Oxfam for what you do on Saturday. I've hosted and housed Syrian refugees for the past few years. I have never met one looking for a handout. Paying them to work is something that's needed just for their own dignity. They're not looking for something for free. They want to earn a living. And I want to compliment you guys for that. So the question I have could either be for you, Professor Hardman, or for Professor Perry. It's a refugee issue but it's not related to, to Syria, it's in Iraq. In Baghdad, at Camp Liberty, the Ashrafi refugees do have a legal and a moral obligation signed by Colonel West Martin, I met him at the White House, for their protection. Yet, Obama has completely ignored this. Their protection is not being afforded. There's a medical siege and blockade on Camp Liberty. People are dying because they can't receive medication. I sent two doctors there that were turned away under threat of if they did not 
turn around and walk away, they wouldn't have time to say their prayers. And so this is a case where there actually is a legal and a moral obligation. Could you comment on what might be able to be done to address something like that, please? One of you, whoever is qualified. I think perhaps either Professor Leaning or Professor Tariq. Well, I could start. Um, the, the promise was made at a time when it could be kept. And now it can't be kept because the United States is not in control of what's happening on the ground in Iraq. And these camps are in places that are under various sector controls. So they can exert influence. But as you know, it's not something that um, Obama or the American public um, have wanted to go back into with any form of substantial influence on the ground, which requires people on the ground and military people on the ground. So. There are so many things that have deteriorated and disintegrated in Iraq and in Afghanistan um, that were first marginally working. The US comes in, and many things happen, and much is destroyed. The US leaves, and then whatever the forces are we were trying to combat now in a different configuration are beginning to seep back. And so we are now dealing with you know, something like the Taliban takeover of Kanduz which was captured in the first months of the war um, in two, fall of 2001. So this is a cycle that is going on. It's, it's bigger than refugee promises. Um, it is many, many promises um, get thrust aside when nation states go to war. And that's one of the reasons one has to pay attention to what you say you're going to do when you advance militarily into a place, because you break things. Now, coming back to the. Um, protection that is created by a, a military document that's transmitted to the commander in chief. Uh, that, is not in, that is not part of refugee law. That is part of occupation. And in an occupation setting, which is what we did actually um, it, it impose on Iraq, it, and that was one of the reasons why there's a lot of contention about the use of occupation, because occupation law has enormous obligations towards the population that is under your occupation authority, including protecting stigmatized minorities. Uh, that goes up through the commander in chief, and he can decide yes or no if he's going to honor it within the context of the occupation. But it's not part of international refugee law. Um, it's basically part of the Fourth Geneva Convention. But as we came out and the occupation ended, then you're really much in a level of a moral obligation of a state to a small segment of a population to which it is actually more <clears throat> thoroughly obligated, but this one was particularly singled out. Um, and how can that be um, actually actualized into a practical response? And I've given you the practical answer that it can't, but I'd be interested in what the philosopher said. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so to me, it seems like it's symptomatic of the larger condition under which refugees are treated. So even when there are legal, legal norms, like the, the norms around non refoulement states routinely violate them. And states do not call each other out on that. Um, there are many, many examples of the human rights of refugees being routinely violated. But states are very interested in making sure that we don't, they don't criticize each other over their treatment of refugees, precisely so that they themselves are criticized over their treatment of refugees. Um, so it's, it's a sp very small, particular instance of this larger problem, that these are, are populations who have no state to appeal to for their human rights. There's no body who's going to adjudicate their claims. And so states know that. And they know that they can sort of fudge their promises to, to refugees in ways that they can't, maybe to other people, like if they're citizens or citizens of other states. I'm going to take a question over here next. Okay, thank you. Um, first, thank you for a very informative discussion and dialogue that's very much needed. Um, my question's not necessarily in line with this, but more so given the economic and climate change associated and other exasperating factors with uh, migration populations. Um, what is the, the role and how do we address the role of uh, NGOs, transnational corporations, and other non-state actors in, in, those, uh, in their facilities and their uh, addressing of international development as a preemptive act, but also as their um, doing work on the ground in, in crises like this. Um, one of the examples I'm thinking about currently is in Kiribati and in Fiji, the continuing of 
bald water by the Fiji company um, while people are trying to buy land to just grow food or even in right here at home, Oakland, uh, where Nestle continues to bottle water while there's a drought going on in California. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, so can you repeat your question? What is your question? Um, my question is just how, how do we as an international community and as uh, academics and, and individuals address the role of NGOs and transnational corporations and, their, and non-state actors and their practices in the realm of how their actions impact uh, global migration issues? Wow. Okay. <laughs> what, can I, what can I suggest? Um, he, you began by asking a really good question around environmental degradation and drought and diminishing water supplies. And what are NGOs doing, A, to address that in a way that keeps people home rather than has them flee? Or what are, who are the bad guys that are there and how is that being dealt with? Yeah. And Oxfam is one of the good guys that deals with that, so you're on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and perhaps we can link with, it, uh, with, with climate issues and, and at the uh, source of the Syrian conflict, I don't know if you... But, um, you know, uh, from an Oxfam perspective, when we do uh, different things, we are a multi-mandate organization, we do uh, long-term programming, which is would address uh, climate change issues, um, agriculture, um, um, the rights of people. We do uh, emergency response, uh, such as what you've seen in my presentation. But we also do advocacy and campaign. And we try to do the three of them in, in an integrated manner. Uh, so when we uh, address a problem, uh, um, uh, a symptom, we also look at what are the rights of the people that are being uh, um, affected. Um, so that, that's how we uh, approach it. And sometimes uh, in our campaigns, we uh, target uh, the private sector. Sometimes we uh, are allies of the private sector, depending on, on what is the issue. Um, in the, uh, um, you mentioned the uh, South Pacific uh, uh, climate change there. It's a, it's a very, uh, um, you know, Visual thing, you you know, uh, I've been to uh, uh, the Solomon Islands and, and I've, I've been in the uh, uh, response to the uh, cyclone pan in Vanuatu this year, and uh, you can hear stories of people that have to be evacuated from islands uh, because of the rise of the sea level, um, and so in those kind of situations, we try to help people uh, first of all adapt to their new realities. Perhaps those are uh, uh, technical uh, solutions are there. But also, we uh, try to address the issues around the policies, right? How the uh, government is uh, addressing um, the problem structurally. Um, that's that's what I, uh, you know, I think that that's our at least our uh, approach. Other organizations have different approaches, and I think, you know, they are all valid. Some of them, you know, have a very clear mandate to do, uh, uh, you know, medical uh, assistance. And that's fine. Others look at you know more uh, globally, or but that's uh, that's the uh, Oxfam's approach. Um, do you want to say something about yeah, climate change yeah. in the Syrian context? Yeah, I mean, uh, not only the climate change. I mean, the the key approach of Oxfam, as Noah said, is about empowering the local actors. <clears throat> so in the Syrian context, I mean, empowering the local actors is not an easy. Especially we have historically, I mean, weak civil society. So when the conflict started, like you have like half of the country or 60% of the country in hard to reach or opposition uh, out of the regime control, out of the Syrian government control areas. So how to access this? We have diaspora people who took the lead in the beginning and started providing mostly medical, uh, shelter, I mean, some other services. One of the things we are trying to do some like how to empower these as a local actor or as a bridge between the international community, the international NGOs, and the local communities in these areas. So this is one of the issues we are trying uh, to work. The other thing is Oxfam also try to uh, make the people or to help the people to design what they want. So in Syria, even before I work with, I mean, Aga Khan Foundation and this the drought 
I was in Syria and we have a very heavy drought in 2006, 2009. And the government was going in the wrong direction. They were providing help like for drip irrigation. You have a critical problem with drought and you are taking the peop giving the people loans. I mean like, so we work on building capacity of people, raising their awareness how to do like, to consume less water, not to use the water only more efficiently. Because I mean, according to that policies, what was happening is more production from the or, and more consumption at the end of the water resources. So the key issue is to empower the local people to design and to help them to design what they need and to think strategically. And I think this is one of the issues Oxfam is good at. Thank you. I'm going to take a question over there next. Well, we have to wonder what the end game is here, whether it's uh, resettlement or repatriation. Uh, David Cameron has announced that uh, Syrian refugees who come to uh, uh, the UK, which, which few can get in, uh, once they reach a majority age of 18, will be returned to their country of origin. Now, there's no, as I understand it, uh, right of resettlement, but there is a right of return in the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights. Uh, there's also one in the uh, Covenant on uh, Political and uh, Human Rights. Uh, but that, too, is a very vague concept. So if people are unwilling uh, to, be, uh, to return, uh, should they be uh, returned by countries which have uh, volunteered to resettle them? And secondly, uh, people who wish to return but are being forcibly barred from return, such as Palestinians, uh, should we make an exception in the right of return? How strong a uh, right and uh, obligation uh, is the right of return, uh, depending on the context uh, in which it's being defined? Thank you. So I'd be happy to answer that. Um, so the question about repatriation is that it's always voluntary repatriation. So what I've read is that in recent years, the UNHCR, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, who adjudicates these sorts of matters, has changed the definition of voluntary. It no longer means that it's voluntary on the part of the people who are being returned. It means that the UNHCR has determined that the, condition, the country, the home country, is in a state in which people ought to want to return home to. So it's taken the agency away from refugees and determining whether or not it's, they should or should not be returned to their home country. So it's a, it, there is still an element of voluntariness there. People can't be forced to be returned, but it has moved away from a subjective concept of um, voluntariness to an objective concept of voluntariness. So that's the first part. <laughs> the second thing I wanted to mention about your question is that I think when we think about, well, what is the solution for refugees? Is it either repatriation or is it re, you know, resettlement? Are we just going to resettle every refugee that comes from every conflict? And I think there's kind of a false dichotomy there. Because ultimately, everyone wants a, a solution. Um, as, as Adeline mentioned earlier, most refugees want to be home. Most human beings want to be in their home country. That's their home. That's where they, they would like to be. Um, so if people are not going home, it's, you know, we can assume, I think, that it's for a good reason. Now, um, having said that, of course, the you know, states aren't going to be opening their doors to resettling refugees. So I really think that we ought to be taking more seriously this interim period of displacement. It's the case now that people live not just their lives, but their lives with their children and their children's children. People live generations in refugee camps in this time between displacement and solution in whatever form that takes. And we just don't pay enough attention to that, either politically or morally. And we end up contributing to all kinds of policies and practices that actually de you know, undermine you know, the lives of refugees in ways that we don't, we don't need to be done. So for example, pr um, the use of refugee camps as long-term er ways of hosting displaced populations is unnecessary. And from a public health point of view, it's often very critiqued as not even being the best way of doing this. So we, if we can focus a little bit on this in-between, certainly look at the end game and look at the solution. Um, but I sometimes worry that looking at the solutions detracts us from this reality, which is that most displaced people are going to live their lives as displaced people. And we ought to treat them well while they are displaced. And we should not be allowed to subject them to systematic deprivations of their human rights while they are displaced just because they are displaced. Professor Well, I would say that uh, legal definitions uh, and practical definitions that are accepted by everybody are, are useful because this, this world is built on migration and people are moving for all kinds of reasons. Uh, 
the extent to which migration, both distress and truly voluntary, you know, I want to get to a better job um, within my own country, uh, the ways in which uh, nation states deal with that are always within the context of protection of sovereignty in national borders. So internal migration within your country, if it's promoting economic growth, is great. If it's because people can't live in one part of the country and need to go somewhere else for a range of reasons, which is sort of a root cause of the Syrian uh, war because of drought and ridiculous state policies in relationship to the drought, um, then it winds up being a source of internal security and the government has to deal with it. Now, in, in that, that context, just the way I'm describing it, this is not an international problem. But it's when the issues within one country begin to create people leaving their country that we get into the issues that are at a level of international um, discussion and right now consternation. Uh, and, and so there I think we need to, to use the language that currently exists for a moment to think about how states are going to respond. There still is a distinction between refugees and generally externally displaced people externally displaced. There are people who leave who are not designated as refugees yet. They have just fled. Uh, all four million of the Syrians that are now in Lebanon, Turkey, Iraq, and Jordan, and Egypt, and wherever else they are, all of them have been designated blanket as refugees by UNHCR. They are therefore to be treated seriously for asylum cases. Now where they can go and how they get there and how they get a hearing is another question. But all of them, and that many of the four million are people who have come from refugee camps already. They have all been designated as refugees. So that is off the table as an argument. They, they now need to go through the process. And that's a very good thing. The process may take months or years. But that designation is what people have fought for in many other battles and never gotten. Okay. Now, the millions that are displaced because of distress in their own country and they leave, Many of them are what we are now calling distressed migrants. And that's where I think uh, some of the issues that um, we're talking about here apply. That is, they're outside their country. They do not have a home they can go back to. They do somehow find their place somewhere. Or they are in these vast refugee camps that actually include a whole lot of people that are not refugees. They're just being warehoused. So the camps on the border between Kenya and Somalia the, those camps are filled with people who would never qualify as refugees, but they can't go back because of war and fighting, or they're coming in from parts of Kenya and going into the refugee camp because there's a little bit more aid there, because Kenya's becoming terrible to live in, particularly the north and desert area. So you have this great numbers of people who are not yet classified as one thing or another, and it is a misery. And this is where I completely agree with you. We need to be thinking about people who are in this tra these transit zones. Being in a transit and gray zone for generations is an appalling dilemma. And it's, it's not really a condition of life that meets safety, dignity, and attends to any of the values we've enshrined in international law. And I, I think that, uh, that, that the, the International Committee is slowly coming to recognize that uh, we, this is not tenable. And, uh, and yet it's also not tenable within some of the nation states. I mean, Nigeria has the third largest number of IDPs in the world. Now, Nigeria is big, so you could have a whole section of that population head around Lagos and Abuja, and they'd have the largest number. But still, when you think that there are IDPs on the outskirts of Nigeria that basically are bigger than the ground area of like Lagos, similarly with Kabul, they're IDPs. And the extension of the footprint of Kabul is now all DPs from elsewhere in, in, in uh, Afghanistan. So the, this, the, the problem of the classification of refugees is tight and problematic, but at least it's a little bit stable. And what we have no way of classifying right now are these people who are externally displaced in these gray areas. And some of them are in refugee camps. Many of them are in the cities. Or in these distressed countries where much of the population of the urban areas are uh, really composed of people who have fled untenable parts of that nation state to be out be us around an area where there's just a little bit of commercial activity and a little bit of anonymity. This is, this is what's happening around the world. And then on top of that, we have this massive 
flow to Europe that is arresting our attention. Thank you. I'd like to take one last question. Thank you. Here. Tell us who you are. Um, I'm from uh, Tufts University. I'm a student. Um, and I just wanted to know, um, we've talked about uh, norms and obligations that states should have to refugees. Um, but we've seen that even obligations that states agree to in international agreements, they don't uh, abide by when it's not their incentive to do so. And so I was wondering, what do you think it requires for states to have an incentive to actually help refugees and to um, fulfill their obligations? Do you think it's a moot point to kind of consider that? And do you think NGOs are actually going to be the ones doing most of the work and we shouldn't really think about states' as incentives? It's a terrific question, absolutely not a moot point, like a fairly profound point. How do you actually motivate states to consider the interests of refugees who, by definition, are outside of their zone of moral consideration? Right? We, by definition, don't have to worry about what re refugees think about us or what they say about us or what they, whether they like us or not. Um, you're absolutely right. So um, the, the way I think about it is if we in the West, if we in the US, for example, could even acknowledge that what we are doing, our policies towards refugees, was problematic, was morally problematic, uh, in ways that I feel like, I mean, there's a parallel with the way we've thought about global poverty for a long time. It used to be, well, there are poor countries who are poor because they made bad decisions, and we can help them out when we feel like it. I feel like now there's a consensus that, well, that's uh, too simplistic of a view of global poverty, and we're actually systematically um, interrelated in the causes of poverty, and it's not just a they made mistakes, it's actually a result of our policies around finance and development and so on and so forth. And therefore, our obligations are to actually reformulate a system so that it's more just in the future. I feel like just changing our thinking around refugees to actually understand what's really at stake and how the crisis or, or what the, the problems around you know, containment of the displaced and warehousing are the result of our policies and our interest in keeping refugees contained. I feel like if, the, if, if we in the West actually acknowledge that, at least we would be able to discuss it. At least it would become something within the frame of our moral consideration. It will always be an uphill battle getting people to think about helping people who you know, we get nothing from, essentially. And some people have argued, well, we can't fight that battle. We should always just think about incentives, you know, stability, security. There are good political motivations, economic motivations you could give to countries to care about refugees. But I think at the end of the day, if you don't have that strong moral foundation to those principles, they tend to water, they, they don't tend to amount to much because often they're not as strong as people would like to believe. So I think it's a really, really profound and important question to think about how to motivate it. And I'm, I'm not hopeless. I am very optimistic. Um, people have changed how they think about refugees historically. People have changed how they've thought about the global poor. People have changed how they've thought about victims as people not in need of help, say, during the Second World War, to people who were t completely entitled to our aid and we did something terrible in not helping them. But it takes time and it takes awareness and it takes a sort of change in, you know, in global politics to really make that happen. You know. I said that was the last question, but there's one more question here. Hello. Um, I'm an architect. I used to work in Damascus during 2009. Uh, now I'm formulating my thesis in urban design around the refugee crisis in the Mediterranean. I have two questions for Arenas. Uh, you referred to the need for open, safe, legal routes to asylum. I was wondering if there are precedents, legal precedents on that. And then a second question would be if you have an opinion or an explanation why the East Mediterranean route uh, rise as the first entry point to Europe this year. And then, since there has been a lot of references on camps, I was wondering who has the agency on designing these camps. Thank you. Um, what, when I was uh, referring to um, um, other um, uh, safer and legal routes uh, to um, um, third countries, I was uh, thinking about uh, work-based immigration, about university places, about uh, uh, possibilities for family reunification. That's what I was uh, uh, referring to. Um, I think that uh, in, in terms of you know why why people uh, risk their lives and, and get in a boat and, and, and try to get to Europe, uh, you know so, you know this this trip is expensive. Uh, um, now now I, it's getting cheaper. I think cheaper. my question is more why they do it through the East Mediterranean route, whereas until 2014 it was mostly through Italy. So I was wondering, what is your opinion about the shift from Italy to Greece? If yeah. there is an explanation that you came up through your research. Yeah, no, I didn't do research on that. But um, um, what, I, what I know is that recently, 
you know, many search and rescue operations in, in Italy have been shifted to uh, border patrol. And that that's makes a lot of difference. Can I, I just comment on that one thing? Because then you've got another big one to answer. But the, uh, the uh, you know, we don't know what a lot of people actually want, these hundreds of thousands who are moving. Uh, and this is already a very interesting question for the NGOs and, and UNHCR. They're developing ways in which they might sort of have self cell phone conversations with people as a way of surveying them because they're a mix of motives as people are moving. But what we um, understand, and I actually have just gotten this through the zeitgeist, I can't give you a reference, is that, is that um, Italy has made it very difficult during those years when it was the, the, the favored place. And now most of the refugees who are coming out are actually looking for a place where they can make not just a life from day to day, but they can make a really good life, a reasonable life. I mean, their aspirations are getting a little bit assertive, which is fabulous. But they realize that Italy is not going to be a place for them. They, it, even though it, they want to get higher up in the northern countries where there are odds that they could actually get a job. I mean, Italy is not a place where they're going to make a livelihood. So that, that is a, there's a set of economic reasons that are making people go through Greece and then get as far north as they can quickly. And uh, this, this is what is fascinating about the agencies of refugees. And, and I might want to um, temper a little bit what you said, which is the receiving nations or those that are watching the people trying to come in. They don't necessarily think that these refugees will give them nothing. There's a huge argument, and you're the expert on this, Anna, but what is, what is the economic value of a refugee or a, 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 um, a distressed migration person, if not classic res refugee? Um, there's, there's a lot of data on both sides to suggest they're really valuable over the next several years, or actually over the first few years they're kind of a drag and then they get valuable, or that they're never valuable, which I think most um, analysts would say is um, poppycock. So the, this issue of they're trying to find a life means they're going to try to be part of a world. And that is, I think, behind their saying, Italy is not a good way station. And I think yeah, another yeah. thing is that Italy was attractive. But for, for people already in camps in Turkey, for example, it was much easier to leave and go through Greece. Greece used to have a land border which people could cross. It was extremely porous. That land border was, border was closed with a fence. Um, and it was after that fence was completed that a much larger fraction of people started being obliged to use a much more dangerous sea route to cross into Greece. And I think not with the expectation of staying there, but no. rather with the expectation that, that they would expedite their journey beyond to countries where people really did want to suffer. It's not that Greece in its current crisis was an attractive destination. So may I add something? Yes, Just, I mean, both Greece and uh, Italy, they are transit countries. I yeah, mean, yeah. I have five of my family, my siblings, they travel to Sweden, but through Greece. It is easier to go from Turkey. Mm -hmm. And they are not destination, I mean, both. So this is why. Yeah. In, in Macedonia, people spend sometimes hours to get from one border to the other and then continue. Uh, when people stay, like in Serbia, two, three days is because they are queuing uh, to be registered. They have no interest in staying there. I think an important lesson is that my refugees, just like other migrants, just like everyone else, are rational people who are looking, given the resources they have, to achieve the best they can for themselves, for their families. They may be, it may be a single person migrating, but with a refugee, in other words, but somebody who's migrating in order to send money back to their family who may have been left behind in a camp somewhere or in an informal settlement outside of town. So most of the people who arrive to Europe, I mean middle income, because it cost uh, my siblings, each one they paid about 8,000 euros to reach uh, Sweden, so which is not available to anybody. So this is why, I mean. Okay, we're definitely over time. It's my job to close this discussion. And I want to thank the panelists very much. Thank you all for coming. Um, and I hope some of us will be continuing this conversation in the aisles. Thank you. Thank you.